Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our final session of the day and of the series. Um, uh, if I could ask Jim uh, McMillan to uh, unmute, put his video back on. There we go. Hi, Jim. So what I want to do uh, for this one, um, uh, some of you may know who've been with us uh, in past conferences that we usually reserve uh, the last session for what we call a journalist roundtable, where journalists themselves, you guys, uh, participants, get a chance to uh, talk about some of uh, the issues that you have had in um, covering the stories, um, uh, criminal justice stories, and in particular, the violence uh, issues. Um, we are essential uh, parts of the formula, if you can, if I can call it that, in terms of how our audiences, how the country sees um, uh, violence and criminal justice, whether it's reform or whether it's change. No and um, what we want to find out a little bit is that what are the what are the lessons we can learn from some best practices um, that have been going on? And to start us off on that, and before I do uh, introduce Jim, um, what I want to do also is involve all of you guys. I know you've been listening avidly, and I'm going to be asking you uh, to chime in uh, at various points. You can go on screen or audio. I'll ask you separately, and but if you want to comment. Of course, just let me know, raise your hand, and um, I'll bring you in. Um, but I'm looking forward to that. If not, I will arbitrarily uh, get ask some of you who I know uh, to make some comments to get us started on the discussion. We have about uh, just an hour, uh, maybe a little bit more to go over it. Uh, but I hope it will be, be particularly useful as a sort of a wrap up to what we've been going through um, for the last day and a half. Uh, so uh, first of all, great welcome to Jim McMillan. Um, He's the founder of the Initiative for Better Gun Violence Reporting. Uh, he's a photojournalist. Bill, uh, Jim spent 17 years at the Philadelphia Daily News, um, and he worked for the Associated Press in Boston. Uh, he was part of a Pulitzer Prize winning team um, uh, for his coverage in Baghdad during the war in Iraq. Boy, do we remember that. That's a ways back. That's really history. Um, uh, his full bio is, of course, available uh, if you download it from our site. Um, Maybe what I'd like uh, Jim to start off with is tell us about a conference that he recently uh, organized um, uh, on the subject of reporting about violence and crime and what he learned from that. Uh, and you can tell us about some of the best practices um, that we might all follow. Uh, Jim, the mic is yours. Uh, terrific. Uh, thank you. Good, good afternoon, everybody, and greetings from Philadelphia. I want to say thank you, first of all, to Steve and Maurice and everyone at the Center for Media crime and justice. I'm, I'm frankly grateful that this institution exists. Um, honestly, my photojournalism career is two careers ago now. I spent some time, I spent about 25 years as a photojournalist, but I've spent the, another decade uh, teaching journalism at five colleges and universities and, and working on spe specifically focused on gun violence prevention journalism much more over the last decade or so. Um, the um, the, the you know the panelists have been priceless uh, so far. Um, I you know I can see that some of the best gun violence prevention journalists in the nation are among the fellows in attendance, and you know I hope I, I hope to get to know all of you. But um, one of the disadvantages of going last is that the speakers have been incrementally you know stealing my thunder, um, especially uh, Fatima Lauren Dreyer yesterday from the Hobby yesterday talked about a lot of what I hope to introduce. I, I, so I'll save your time on that. Um, but but Fatima also, you know, she talked about the need for empathy, the absence of solutions, or perhaps a shortage of solutions reporting and, and attention to who does the reporting. Um, and, you know, we heard Mayor Scott uh, say, sometimes looks as if news organizations use suffering as clickbait. And who hasn't seen that? Um, and I could go on and on. Um, there's just so much, but you know, you were here too. Heard, there, there's so much we can take away from the speakers, but um, I, I should probably jump ahead. You know, get, you know, given all the great minds here, I'm not here to, you know, I wanna be clear. I'm not here to lecture to anyone, but rather to serve as a conduit to the information I've been gathering on better gun violence reporting over the last few years um, and collaborate hopefully with you continually, continually from here to see how we can do it better. Um, Steve suggested that I, I kick this off, the session off by, you know, telling about my work at the center, but also raise some provocative questions. I'm going to just throw one big one out there before, before I talk about the summit. And that's really the big one that defines, you know, everything I work on is, you know, what is journalism? And, and that sounds really fundamental, but what I'm talking about is that when I bring up gun violence prevention journalism, some colleagues confront me pretty sternly 
They say, that's not our job, Jim. That, that, you know, I'm here to report, I, you know, just the facts. And, you know, I respect them. I respect, I, I deeply respect them. I respect journalists who just want to tell us what's happening, to keep us informed, to tell people stories, write the first draft of history, afflict the comfortable. You've heard all the missions and everyone's got their own because, you know, we've got no, because they're entitled to. And, you know, they care, they work hard, sometimes at great personal cost, and they provide important public services. But, you know, as Steve reminded us yesterday, we're here to focus on, on journalism, um, you know, more than just solutions to violence. But what if better reporting can be a solution? What, what, you know, what about comforting the afflicted? Um, no matter what one does for a living, if you can make some adjustment to your practice and save lives, wouldn't you want to know? Um, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but, but answering that question is our mission. In, in a nutshell, at the Center for Gun Violence Reporting, we're exploring, and, and the Initiative for Better Gun Violence Reporting, we're exploring the hypothesis that changing the way journalists and news organizations report on gun violence can prevent shootings and stop the killing. And, you know, our, our, on our theory of change, you know, yesterday you heard uh, Tim Daly from the Joyce Foundation talk about the, the power of informed news consumers to prevent violence. And other speakers talk about your power to inform the public. Well, that, that's essentially our theory of change. We, we look at violence prevention journalism, resulting in narrative change, leading to changes in public opinion, changes in policy, policies and systems, and violence prevention. It, it's a theory so far, but, but I, I, should, I, I wanna tell you about how we get started. And for that purpose, I should probably share my screen and go to a deck here. It's just a, a handful of slides. Um, and, uh, it feels as if they're not where I left them. But, um, can you see my screen now? Can somebody confirm? Uh, can't yet, but um, if you press on share screen, you should be able to see it on your desktop. Yeah, okay, maybe here we go. You know what, I have a, a privacy setting to deal with, excuse me. Um, I'll be there in just a moment, privacy, zoom, okay. And unlock, oh, I almost read my password out loud. Um, we'll close our ears. <laughs> and we're getting there, sorry, sorry for the delay. Um, uh, it's telling me to quit and reopen, quit Zoom and reopen. Perhaps that, that seems terribly disruptive. Um, perhaps I should just keep talking. Um, that's you know what, uh, uh, Jim, while you're talking, why not send the, um, uh, you know, the slides to um, Chris Graham, if you have his, do you have his email? I don't know that I do. I'm very sorry for this confusion. Try sending it to me and I'll see if I can share it. Uh, will do. Okay, terrific. Thanks so much. Um, just be a moment. Steve, I just sent it to Jim in the chat. Uh, okay, good. Chris has just sent you his email. Um, except that, except that I'm sending the deck from a different workstation. It's a, it's a long story, but it is a different one for proof. Can I see, can I send it to you, Steve? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'll have to uh, close down my screen to watch it. Yeah. Let me know when you send it, and I'll get it up. It's terrific. It's sending, so I'll continue now. I'm very sorry for that interruption. Um, right. And I'll um, come back here to. Um, to my notes in just a moment. So, so I, I can start talking and catch up with the pictures. You know, partly I want to show you my show you the, the friends and colleagues I work with. But um, what I wanted to talk about, you know, was was how you know how we get started because I think the origin story explains what we're trying to do. There's there's this guy, as uh, many, many of you I suspect might know him, named Scott Charles. He's the trauma services coordinator at Temple University Hospital here in Philadelphia, and they see you know several shooting victims every day on average um, at Temple. And um, about three years ago, uh, Scott noticed that. One of the trauma surgeons at Temple and I were saying the same things about gun violence in the media. The difference is that I was talking about addressing violence through solutions journalism, uh, the topic of a course I had been teaching. And Dr. Jessica Beard, the trauma surgeon, was talking about public health intervention. 
Um, and you see, besides treating gunshot victims every day and night at work, Dr. Beard is an esteemed public health researcher. And so I, I hopped as soon as I, I you know, we, we got connected, I, I, I took their invitation to meet. I hopped on the subway and went up to Temple University Hospital as soon as I could. And, you know, we, we really hit it off. And um, we, this led us to um, the, the, next, the next thing we decided to do was to write um, an opinion piece. Uh, for the for the Philadelphia Inquirer here, in, you know the, the leading news organization here in Philadelphia, and um, we, you know, we wrote about the need for better reporting on gun violence to help reduce gun violence, and it had a, a you know kind of good general traction. But what was unusual, I had an explosive volume of back channel conversation from all sorts of new new people in my network, different sorts of experts from epidemiology, criminology, public health from clinicians, from uh, researchers from so many disciplines and their comments on the idea of better, re better reporting, reducing violence were pretty powerful. Among them, they said, it's a no brainer. You have to do this. It's the missing link. Of course it will work. Um, so you know, fa fast forward um, another year um, in summer of 2019, I landed a, a fellowship at the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri but I did all my field work back home here in Philly and some funders and partners chipped in. And in late 2019, um, really just before the pandemic in the big picture, we hosted the Better Gun Violence Reporting Summit at WHYY here in Philadelphia. Um, and, um, the, and I had all pictures, all these great pictures to show you, show, show this, but um, it was remarkable. We had 250 people in attendance. We had journalists from the New York Times to the LA Times, from Boston to, to Orlando. Um, we had journalists from small markets in like Allentown and Flint um, and, and from public media and uh, legacy media, community media, digital first, independent journalists. There was so much interest. It was pretty clear we were onto something. Um, I was um, on stage. We had throughout the day, we had uh, journalists who cover gun, gun violence uh, locally and nationally, um, researchers from that whole spectrum of disciplines I was talking about and community representatives. Um, the, uh, and, and before, yeah, before the, well, and, and I'll get back to the community representatives. Um, but, and the other thing that was really crystal clear was the, the sidebar networking over lunch in particular and throughout the day was really powerful. And we've learned through surveys over time that a lot of new relationships were built that day. Um, before the summit, if you can imagine what this looks like. Uh, before the summit, we held a community conversations event um, at Temple, at a, 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 co a conference space at Temple University Hospital. And we brought together 30 people with extensive lived experience who had been affected by gun violence uh, with 15 journalists from the city who play some role um, covering gun violence in Philadelphia. And the um, it was it was a, a powerful day um, in many ways. Now I realize I'm going to need the deck to talk about some things. So. Pull us out here. Um, and so we're trying, the, open, we're trying to get it opened up. I couldn't open up your PDF, so I sent it on to Chris. And oh, my, sorry. oh, I see, because it was a keynote if you're a PC user. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, I think I probably shouldn't get into exporting and resending on the fly. Um, you know, the, the pictures aren't 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 essential. I'm a little bit heartbroken, but um, but but I'll, I'll, I'm halfway I'm halfway through the visual part anyway. Um, so the um, Anyway, before the summit, we had this, this community conversations event that I mentioned. Uh, we had a we, we started with a trauma talk for the benefit of everybody. Um, we did some speed networking so that all of the journalists and community representatives got to you know look in each other's eye, you know, for five minutes at a time, uh, exchange contact information, ask what each other does and thinks and cares about. Um, and we did some focus group research. Well, I didn't. Um, one of our key partners did. Um, there's a, a professor, Jennifer Midbury, who is um, a, she's a journalism professor at. Um, Lehigh University now, and she was, um, but she was previously a photographer at the Philadelphia Daily News at, when I was 15, 15 to 20 years ago. And um, she's, she hasn't published yet, but she shared some uh, preliminary uh, findings at that, at that summit. And, um, and they were, we got a pretty strong message from the community and what they thought of um, you know what they want from journalists and what they thought, and they 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 cited you know things you've been hearing for a couple of days, you know primarily negative coverage of communities, 
dehumanized portrayals, pretty, you know, pretty powerful language. Um, they complained about the lack of context and the, the absence of structural and, and systemic issues. Uh, they complained about the lack of follow-up on stories and said, you know, journalists parachute in too often. And, and you know, to be clear, this is the kind of journalism I did once and, and I'm trying to learn from and change. Um, they they com complained about an outsider perspective, which I think is pretty obviously related to another elephant in the room, the lack of diversity in newsrooms um, and stereotypical coverage. They um, they made some recommendations, sort of com commensurate recommendations. They want they wanted a commitment to understanding communities from journalists. They want to see more balanced coverage. They want well, they want us to prioritize community voices, to be more empathetic, to contextualize the problem. And, um, and without knowing anything about my interest in solutions journalism, they want more reports on efforts being made to combat gun violence. Uh, Midbury then compared this with um, the SPJ code. For anyone, I know there are some viewers outside of journalism, the, the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics is kind of our primary code in journalism. And there are about, you know, to be fair, there are about you know, 40 bullet points in there, I think, if not more. But, but, but Midbury pointed out a few uh, responsibilities to seek truth, be accurate, provide context, minimize harm, avoid stereotyping, and boldly tell the story of diversity, and gave us just a thumbs down on all of those based on the, on the community feedback. Um, okay, so the, um, so the best practices. So at the end of the summit, we developed this set of best practices uh, for journalists who cover gun violence. And you can find those um, at our, our original site is ibgvr.org uh, for the initiative for better gun violence reporting and um and we can you know i could, I could talk about these all day and you, you can go you can go read them as well each one has a each, each bullet so there are you know seven bullet points on the home page and they each have drop down menus but you know number one above all was the responsibility to earn your place in the community it might sound obvious but it doesn't happen enough and I think we all know that. Um, the one, one example I remember from the stage was, um, because I'm sorry, to be clear, the set of best practices is, is informed almost entirely by the summit and the community conversations event and as well as my various research. Um, but one but example of uh, Jonathan Bullington, who's, who's one, of the, one of the fellows here. Sorry? We, we'll, we'll post the uh, URL of that um, uh, as, as soon as you give it to us. Uh, sure. It's I-B-G-V-R. Best to send it to us, or actually, uh, maybe Emily can put it on the screen as well. But go ahead. Sorry. Okay. And, and so, 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 so there, there are seven bullet points, and you could, should spend some time with them. And they, they all have drop down menus with a great deal of detail. But you know, number one above all was to earn your place in the community. I remember one example from the summit. Jonathan Bullington, who is one of the fellows here, uh, talked about working with a reporting colleague and opening, as I recall, you, I hope you can correct me if I'm mistaken, opening up shop in you know in in a distressed community. But before reporting, just spending was it a month? Was it three months? But spending a good amount of time there just getting to know everybody. And there was lots of advice, you know, go, you know, go, go, go to, you know, demonstrations, memorials, church breakfasts, everything. Um, it, it sounds pretty obvious, but you've really, I mean, you know, and I, I've done this firsthand as well. You've just really got to spend the time. Um, remember who and what is important. And, um, you know, that, that was about putting, you know, community narratives first and um, exploring the full spectrum of experts. And, you know, I'm, I'm just clicking and reading through this. Recognizing the complexity of the topic, um, I'm going to make another recommendation that I, I don't think has come up. The folks at uh, the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Prevention, and Research and Prevention, they have a new name. Forgive me if I've, I've booted a little bit, but they have a, 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 a MOOC, an online course on Coursera on, uh, on understanding gun violence. And you know, just the index of that course has so many subjects and headings and keywords that anyone who thinks they've got a comprehensive understanding of gun violence really needs to dig in a little deeper. While I'm at it, one more recommendation: the the the, the um, it, you know they've come up so many times, but the um, the Daily Bulletin newsletter from the Trace. It's my beacon. They 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 take the they 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 respond to the complexity better than any other organization I can think of. Um, and I, I'll just go through a couple more. You know, another point was to disrupt misconceptions. Here in Philadelphia, for example, and probably everywhere, there's a great deal of reporting on how many guns uh, police have recovered this year, crime guns in, in their language because of who possesses them. But, you know, there's very little evidence that um, 
that, that, that getting the guns away from people with no hostile intent is going to significantly change levels of gun violence, for example. Um, I, I could go on forever. Um, the uh, don't cover engage, and, and it's sort of like running your place, you know, just you know, rather than saying, I want to put you in my story, communicate that I want to help tell your story, for example, um, to report with intention, you know, it, what's, the, what's the impact of reporting? You know, there's that whole discipline of peace journalism that looks at the relationship between the reporting and the outcomes. Does, 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 is the reporting making the conflict worse? Could it make it better? Um, and, and, you know, this was designed around in, international and civil strife, but, you know, I used to, I had the, I, I once studied and taught a course on this topic at, at Swarthmore, and whenever I spoke about it, somebody would raise their hand and say, can't you apply the same logic to the crime beat? Um, Watch your language. Um, you know, again, there are so many examples here. Um, the opening panel, they talked about, you know, um, racist code words um, and dog whistles. And, and they, they, they mentioned the way urban is often used in, in, in reporting. They also brought up gritty, which was one that didn't, you know, ring a bell for me until I was a little more informed. Um, but again, you know, it, not to uh, adopt, uh, you know, uh, the police vocabulary of, you know, for example, police involved shooting. If a police officer shot somebody who they say did something, say what you know, say what you say, rather than rather than adopting their language. Um, I heard uh, I, I, somebody joking on Twitter last week, um, say, you know, compar comparatively saying that makes you know, suggesting that makes about as much sense as calling a, a shark attack a shark involved biting. You know, it's just it doesn't make any sense. Um, the um, and, and so on. there there's a section of additional considerations. And I just, I'll just say this very briefly, uh, one is self-care. And I could talk about that at length, another subject I've studied and taught. Um, but, you know, healthy journalists are better journalists and, you know, we need, we need all of you um, on board. So, so anyway, spend, you know, I, I recommend spending some time. Um, I'm gonna come back just briefly to talk, tell, update you a little bit on what we've done since then. And um, because of how it will uh, relate to, um, to best practices. Um, so at the, in the second year of this work, just concluding, we're, after a couple of years now, a year ago, we launched the Philadelphia Center for Gun Violence Reporting. It's based at Community College of Philadelphia. And we're doing a bunch of things related to well, what you've been hearing for the last couple of days. And I'd love to tell you about it at length. That's at pcgvr.org, the Philadelphia Center for Gun Violence Reporting. Um, and the um, we have an emer emerging community journalism initiative called the Credible Messenger Reporting Project, where we pair community representatives with extensive lived experience and, and to, you know, related to gun violence and advanced professional journalists to leverage their combined expertise to report on root causes, lived experience, um, and possible solutions, but from the community perspective. Um, compensation is solid, maybe pretty good. And that's because we value people's time as um, Mr. McGill from PowerCore said yesterday. Um, we just received second year funding. We're looking at, at, at um, we're collaborating right now to try to develop replications in three more cities. And tomorrow night, one of our Philadelphia um, uh, teams, Incredible Messenger teams actually has a screening on uh, on uh, Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia is very exciting for us. Um, I also, I also, it, and this is me so far because we're trying to operationalize this. I, I provide a lot of informal service to journalists, mostly pointing them to data, resources, um, a more perhaps a more broad spectrum of experts on on the topic. Um, even making some back channel corrections at times. Um, this summer, our interns tried to operationalize that a little bit. We launched a, a Slack channel, um, but uh, to be honest, it's falling flat so far. So that's something, and that's it's bigger than me, of course. It's it's all of us, right? But that's something else I'd like to hear from from the group here. It's you know, um, you know how how do we do, how do we build on this movement of people that care about reporting? doing a better job reporting on gun violence? Is it, do we need a membership organization, a Facebook group or a hashtag, or, or do we just need more of a critical mass? So um, there's, a, there's a lot to unpack here, Jim. I just wanna um, open it up a little bit because uh, first of all, we will be circulating as some other um, our fellows have asked, we'll be circulating the contact um, addresses and phone numbers of all of our speakers, including Jim. Uh, so you will have them uh, by the end of the webinar series as soon as we get to them. Uh, I know some of you want to speak to some of the uh, speakers right away. If I can get them out uh, to you today, I will. But at any rate, as we start, um, since Jim mentioned uh, one of our, uh, an idea 
uh, best practice really by one of our participants, um, Jonathan Bullington, about it sounds like he did had a really interesting idea about setting up shop in an area where there had been a shooting or there had been a lot of violence. And I thought I would invite Jonathan to talk a little bit about that experience and maybe um, uh, invite some comments from the rest of you. So Jonathan, um, unmute yourself and you're on. Hey, thanks. I'm a little under the weather, so I apologize if my voice is, breaks a bit. But um, yeah, uh, thanks so much for uh, for putting this on. Um, you know, we this is this started uh, a couple of years ago. I and a colleague at the Times Picayune in New Orleans, a guy named Rich Webster, we had this idea that we wanted to write about uh, exposure to violence. Uh, what exposure to violence does to children in New Orleans, and we zoomed in on a particular neighborhood in New Orleans called Central City. Um, it's a neighborhood that is, um, you know, one of the most historic and culturally rich neighborhoods in that city, but it has also struggled for years with disproportionate rates of, of gun violence and poverty and disinvestment by the city. Um, we were fortunate enough, we got a grant from the University of Southern California's uh, Annenberg Center for Health Journalism. And part of that grant uh, included this community engagement money, which um, we, we had this idea, Rich and I had this idea that we, you know, to do that work, we thought it was important that we were in the neighborhood as much as we possibly could be. Um, and so we were trying to figure out what would that look like. And we landed on this idea that we would just move out of our newsroom and rent a temporary office space in Central City. There was this place, it's unfortunately closed now. It used to be called Apex Youth Center. It was just on the edge of Central City in a former, like a, a old Catholic school. Um, and it was a, like one of the only youth drop-in centers for kids in that neighborhood. And um, so we rent, we used our engagement money and we rented uh, a room upstairs in Apex. And we were there for four months and that was our newsroom, uh, just Rich and I. And as, um, as Jim said, the, the very first thing we did, and this was something that we had learned as part of that fellowship. I think somebody else, I wanna say he was in New Mexico. I can't remember, but he was writing in New Mexico and he had this idea that he would meet with community members and he wouldn't bring his notebook. Um, and we thought, oh, that's, that's a good idea. So for about a month, that first month after Rich and I moved out, we met with anyone and everyone that we could think of in, um, the neighborhood. And um, we didn't have a notebook and we introduced ourselves. We told them what we wanted to do. And then we just shut up and listened. And we asked a lot about, you know, the only questions we would ask is, um, where have other reporters gone wrong in the past when they've tried to tackle this topic? Um, what would you like to see out of this project? If you were the editor, what is it that you would like to see? And, and also, who else do we need to be talking to? Um, and um, a lot of really fascinating things happened. You know, we learned what people didn't want to see was a lot of what's been covered over the course of this two-day seminar, which is people were tired of being portrayed as uh, hopelessness, that the neighborhood is just violent, that people don't really pay attention to all the good things that are happening in Central City and all of the good hard work that people have been doing in that community. Um, and then in the course of talking to people, we were put onto this youth football team and um, that plays in Central City. And we ended up following around that football team for nearly a year and um, then wrote a series of stories that uh, for the Times Picky even called the Children of Central City. I don't have a link because I did not plan to be talking about this today, but um, well, uh, it was some, yeah. Yeah, I'll try to find it. Um, I, the Times Picayune was sold and their website was blown up, so I don't even know how to find it. But I'll um, right, right, right. I'll, I yeah, I'll see what I can do. But anyway, it was a it was a great uh, experience, and, and we certainly learned a lot. Okay, um, I've asked the, the rest of you also to chime in if you have some ideas or practices that you want to share. Uh, one of, one of the things we're hoping is that uh, we'll get a little, you know, an argument or a discussion going about some of the challenges we face. Uh, you know, throughout the the um, webinar yesterday and today, I mean, we've heard that we have a problem uh, or people have a problem with us with reporters about contextualizing. We don't put enough context in our stories. And of course, as I don't need to tell you, it's easier said than done. Um, it's the kind of throwaway paragraph that most people just um, look right past. So I'm wondering 
uh, how other people have dealt with this. Um, I mean, how you've integrated a story that's unavoidable to do, a shooting with, um, you know, the deeper message or the deeper issues that are involved in this, in this particular shooting. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I know, I think David Dudley is still in the, um, in the uh, window. I'm wondering if David would like to say a few things about how he deals with it, <coughs> excuse me, in, um, in the West, in Utah. David, if you're there, uh, raise your hand and I'll be glad to call on you. I don't see him. Let's see. I think he's still in the uh, in the in the audience. Um, uh, Jim. In the meanwhile, feel free to to um, to comment, and I'll ask some other folks to see if I can find um, David. Sure. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll jump past the the activity of the center, but um, yeah, just in terms of some prompts, you know, it's. It, it, I'm wondering if anybody else is, you know. This has been self-selection and who signs up for a conference like this, but does anybody else run into um, sort of this conflict I talked about and, and how they respond to it? You find yourself accused of traipsing into activism or advocacy, uh, you know, and I wonder how protecting news consumers from gun violence is different than, you know, helping protect them from the spread of COVID or evacuate from a hurricane or avoid a traffic jam. It's, it's th is there really a counter argument? And, um, you know, the, the other, the other question is, you know, does it, do you get accused of, of a bias? Because I would argue that in, in this, in journalism, there is historically a bias, bias toward violence in, 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 in this area. You know, what, you know, what, you know, what we have, a you know, why do we have a crime beat instead of a, a gun violence or a violence prevention beat? You know, we have we have business and health beats, but not bankruptcy and illness beats. What there the, and 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 how and how do you respond to that? You know, and then I don't know if anyone's here from there, but um, there was a, a I thought a terrific example a couple of years ago in a project from the Chattanooga Times Free Press. Uh, they came to they sent a couple of reporters to Philadelphia to look at gun violence prevention efforts when frankly things were going a little better here. And, um, but they didn't, with all respect to police beat reporters, they didn't send the police beat reporter. They sent a business reporter and they sent a science and health reporter. Um, so, so yeah, I'm wondering if those sort of, those sort of challenges have come up for anybody, how they're dealing, how they're feeling about them, um, whether they think I'm right or wrong um, and, and, and how, and, and you know, how to respond. That's great. I have, I have, um, um, Send a message to David if he's still there. But I do notice that um, uh, we have one person on the screen, Jay Gilmore, who's not a journalist, but uh, I believe he works for a nonprofit. So I wonder, Jay, if you have some, you've had a lot of good questions, some of which we weren't able to ask about um, media issues. So I wonder if you have some ideas about how the media can do things better. Um, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, and you're welcome to join us. Hi, Jay. Uh, well, <clears throat> hello. Well, thank you for inviting me to jump on and say something. I appreciate that chance. Um, I, I am definitely torn by the need to get out more of the stories because the, the headlines usually is just the, the, the bloody and gutsy part of it. But usually there's a, in, every, in every situation, there's a story that needs to be told. And I'm just wondering how how we can get that greater story out there. How can we say more so we don't just focus it on on the, the most gruesome and in our, geogra our geographic region, I mean, we have stories that are over a you know, hundred miles around and the city of Pittsburgh is much smaller than that. So everything looks like it's in the city of Pittsburgh when it's outside and could be far away from us. And then all it does tarnish the black communities and it doesn't, and, and doesn't, doesn't hurt other communities, but it hurts our communities. So how do we get a bigger story told? Uh, Jim, go ahead and answer that. Uh, unmute, unmute yourself first. Okay. I was just trying to find the button. Thank you. Um, the um, so so you know the the closing session at our summit was called uh, widening the lens, and it was uh, it the, the uh, Dr. Beard, who's who I mentioned earlier, is now the director of research at the center. But she she both she she cur she mo curated and moderated and presented uh, during the during this uh, session. But basically, you know, we heard we heard from we heard from researchers about the. You know his historic structural, uh, you know historic structural and systemic issues. We I think we one one of the speakers spoke addressed the you know the 
the potential of working with the built environment. But basically, I think the way to expand the story is to, forgive me, this is so fundamental for advanced reporters, but it's to expand the sources and 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 to figure out, in, in, instead of instead of looking at who's coming to you, figure out who you, you, know, you need to go to. And it's that, that whole spectrum of experts I, I, I mentioned before, but also there are experts in the community, of course, right? People, people who, are, who, are, who are living living with this firsthand. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a popular cliche that rings true for me that those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And I don't know that anybody has the whole solution by themselves, but widen the lens and, 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 and bring in a, a, a more broad spectrum of experts. Thank you, Jim. I've got uh, Tristram Corton uh, on the line. Who's hey. got a few things to say? Tristram, go ahead. You're on. Yes. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm having. You can hear me, correct? Uh, we can. We can't see you though. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, here we are. So I'm having flashbacks to the '90s, uh, covering the the quote unquote crack wars. In the streets and, this, and, the, and the allegations of drive-by journalism and, and uh, uh, overburdened newsrooms trying to cover rising crime rates and a, and a growing uh, intolerance for crime from the public. And I fear we're heading that way again with the added challenge of a, a diminished newsrooms and diminished funding that Project New Orleans sounded great, but I guarantee you, my Herald or you know your 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 Metro Daily is not going to spend the money on that now. Uh, and <clears throat> I, I like the idea of the idea of sending. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, just to I just cut out. Yeah, I just cut it out for a second. I'm sorry. I like the idea of sending a business reporter or a, a health reporter. Those are. That's what's going to need to happen. Is people are going to, the newsroom is going to have to think outside the box uh, for for rising above those challenges. But I just see us going in that direction. And while history might not repeat itself, we're we're going to see a lot of the same cultural forces impacting our reporting. People not caring. They don't want sympathetic portraits of uh, victims, even you know if those victims are related to crime, etc. Yeah, you know, let me seize on that. I think that's one of the really interesting points is that, you know, we've always been locked into beats, you know, the crime beat, the health beat, the education beat. And I think a lot more people now are looking at, given the the parlous state of newsrooms around the country, whether broadcast or print, um, people are covering a multitude of beats. Um, and having a kind of multidisciplinary approach to this, um, to the issue of gun violence, mirroring what we've been hearing today about sort of a multi multi agency approach you know might produce some really interesting stories i mean the other alternative is we do have um outlets that are particularly seized with covering um with gun issues or violence issues the trace for example is the best example of it we had some folks who were uh who were in our group from the trace uh, i don't know if they're still on today and one of them was uh, James Burnett was hoping to be part of the discussion, but he couldn't. Uh, but I'm wondering if anybody, if that has resonance with anybody working across the aisle, so to speak, with either other outlets or other journalists in your newsroom um, uh, to cover an issue. It means sharing bylines, of course, and sharing sources, but it's one way to get more people interested and in, in add to the context. And then I want to move to Hillary Powell. I'm going to put her on, uh, on screen in a second. Anybody have any ideas? Or maybe, uh, Hillary, I think you're on. If you, yeah, there you are. So, Hillary, uh, if you have an idea about that, and particularly with Associated Press, where you can, you have a mass, a mass resource of folks um, from a bunch of different disciplines who could cover a story from a lot of different angles. Would that work in AP? Stephen, repeat your question. I'm having some audio issues too. So, so sorry. Hello, everybody. Hi, Hillary. So what my question is whether the multidisciplinary and multi-agency approach we've heard about today from uh, some of the municipal folks in our last panel and from the mayor of Baltimore yesterday might be reflected or copied, if you will, by journalists who you have a health journalist, an education journalist, uh, environmental journalist, and if people can share their beats and share their sources you might get the kind of well-rounded story that people seem to be expecting of us now. 
Um, Is that practical with AP? I um, thank you for um, hearing my voice and adding it to the course that we have. Um, I am the actual first video journalist hired for the AP in DC before um, they didn't have a person like me who writes, shoots and edits and does multi multidisciplinary things, I, I guess you could say. Um, so the AP is traditionally siloed. Um, so that we usually have writers, um, photographers and um, video specialists. Um, in covering gun violence, I usually reach my hand out to each of those silos. So if there's a gun, um, a surge in crime, for example, that's um, we've seen in certain Southeast DC communities recently, um, it's usually me going out down with my camera, but I also might um, tag in someone who traditionally writes for um, text and then also tagging in someone who does photography journalism. So um, for more traditional outlets, I think it is kind of a pivot sometimes um, that they might not have exactly um, a justice beat, um, depending on what medium, a, a, a race and culture beat, depending on what medium. I mean, do you feel particularly I, with a, a, AP is covering the news as it happened? So, I mean, you're kind of stuck. If there's a shooting uh, in, a, in, a, in a neighborhood or wherever it is, you've got to cover the shooting and, you know, any extraneous stuff, the context, or whatever, is not necessarily going to be going to be appreciated by your editors, I imagine, because it just adds more space. Uh, am I right? Well, I think with the reckoning that we've had, um, the racial reckoning that we've had over the past year um, throughout the pandemic and in the death of George Floyd, um, there has been a calling, a clarion call for more um, more attention to making sure you have equitable coverage, period. So I think editors are attuned. But at AP, I, I'm very comfortable that they're attuned. But you see CBS has started um, an, a culture unit. ABC has a race and culture unit. I think gone are the days that we don't use race and, um, you know, to call things what they are, um, you know, so I, we have um, a justice department here at AP. And I think now we're just starting to scratch the surface on making sure we're telling those um, justice and crime stories across all platforms, not just for print. I, so, I'm, I have to say that I'm really impressed uh, so far with the kind of job people are doing in mm -hmm. covering the kind of community intervention stories and groups that we've been talking about. Oh, yeah. Uh, this week. I mean, and we have a couple of examples on our website. I hope we'll get more from you guys. Uh, and that gives us, that's a perfect kind of approach. Um, it's Solutions Journalism. Many of you have uh, know about that organization. It's talking about how you can cover the, the solutions, not the problem. So, you know, we're doing a fairly good job on that. But I think there are other issues, obviously, is whether, you know, that sort of stuff sort of drives the patience of editors, as not to mention readers. Uh, I wanted to bring Sarah Bowden up. She's got some interesting comments, which you've all seen in uh, the chat room. So, um, Sarah, feel free. You're on uh, the screen. So if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself and on video or video yourself, please, you're welcome to. Um, can you hear me? I'm sorry. It's very loud right now. And I didn't realize you were going to call on me. Um, yeah, so I think that yeah. a lot of these recommendations are really smart and thoughtful um, and thinks about all the causes of violence and how like you can't just like take away someone's gun or provide them education it has to be very intersectional. Fact of the matter is I work in a newsroom with eight reporters. I am the only healthcare reporter in my newsroom. And um, I guess hearing these solutions, I feel a little frustrated um, because I feel like I came to this um, training hoping to get some really concrete answers. And some of it was really helpful, um, but a lot of like the big picture solutions aren't going to work for me. So what would work for you? I don't know. <laughs> Funny, like honestly, when people say, you know, I get yelled at all the time by people in my community. My newsroom does too. And we also say, we, you do a great job. Thank you so much. But we get some really valid criticism 
um, that I agree with. But the fact of the matter is, um, you know, there's eight reporters and then a handful of producers and editors. And what we really need, sorry about that. What we really need is sustained foundational support so that we can do our jobs better and cover this more nuance. What like, do you mean by that? Deconstruct that. You mean, you mean like, money? Like, yeah, we need, we need, we need five more reporters if we're going to do what you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I feel like if you want to see a change in especially how local media covers these issues, then, you know, <laughs> get us more reporters. And also like, and like those reporters like should be from the communities that we're covering. One of the issues with my newsroom is that we're mostly white people. Um, and that's an issue. That's a really big issue when you're in a city like Pittsburgh. Um, but yeah, like to me, these are not like, oh, like do your project this way, praise it this way. These are structural issues with local media across the country. And until we address how harmed journalism is uh, with the shrinking newsrooms, the, pro the solutions you guys are suggesting can are not going to work. Uh, Jim, do you yeah, want to... I was going to add on to that to oh, say go ahead, go ahead, I think equity is important when we're talking about this and making sure all voices are at the table. Um, I've been covering ceasefire and organizations like that for more than a decade, beginning back when I was working in Chicago. Um, they have always, and then I moved over to working in Gary, Indiana. Um, so those, they, they have always been topics of import to me, and I was always going to find a way to cover them. Um, so editor, annoyed or not. Um, they are a thread that is reflective in all my storytelling because I come from the communities in which these stories are happening. So um, tagging what Sarah said, I think diversity is important um, because that's how you're going to get those divorce, um, excuse me, diverse topics at the forefront because I'm never stop talking about them. There is one thing we can do, and it goes back to context. Uh, and it's one of the things we try to do at the center when we uh, hold our training programs is that it's one thing to, you know, cover a story, to eyeball a story, to be the eyewitness for a shooting or a protest or whatever else. But when you come back to the newsroom and write it, you really need to have some, um, some level of information about what's been done or said or studied about it by research and scholarship. There's so much scholarship um, that has been committed over the last several years alone about what works and what doesn't work in criminal justice, what we're calling evidence-based reporting. And it's not hard to get, it's not hard to obtain, and it's not hard, I mean, that's our job is to translate it into something that's, um, that's articulate, that's uh, coherent, and that's readable. And even adding some of that, when we talk about statistics, um, goes a long way towards bringing in the context that we're talking about. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of money, it doesn't take a lot of extra time, it just takes an extra effort, I think, to look at the what's actually been done research-wise. And when our center was formed, this is about 10 or 12 years ago, we identified what we call sort of an information gap or, or a, um, a trust gap between researchers, between academics and journalists. Academics complained that, you know, they were never taken seriously or they were just treated as sound bites, uh, which may be true. And journalists complained that academics were too, um, we're talking too much above the head of their readers. And they never really cared about explaining what they were about. Um, we hope that in some of the things we've done, just like uh, this week, that by talking directly to the people who are actually involved in studying uh, these issues or in working these issues, you find a way, a common language, to describe a little bit of what you're doing. And, and you know, that, that certainly can't hurt. I, I don't know, Jim, if you agree with that, but that's certainly one remedy. Well, there's there's a lot to unpack in this topic. Um, I mean, it's a good question. I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, Sarah's newsroom. I, I know. You know, public media is does often does a better job than, than than some other news organizations. But you know, for example, well, let me let me look at address it a couple of ways. I spent a lot of time thinking and, and investigating and teaching journalism ideals, things like peace journalism, trauma journalism, solutions journalism, and most of them conflict with deadline journalism. That's just a reality. And, and so improving is hard. 
Um, at the same time, realistically, you know, we learned a decade ago when some journalists objected to extra responsibilities from, you know, tweeting to carrying a video camera that for everything new that you put on somebody's desk to do, you have to take something else off. You know, there's, there's, there's a formula here. There's a, everybody's resources are limited, of course. Given that, then the, the, the solution might be the solution, a strategy might be to look at what you can let go of. So in Philadelphia, and probably not at Sarah's public radio station, but in Philadelphia, if I could just convince, if I could wave a magic wand and spend a fraction of the effort that's covered on shallow episodic reporting, an 18 year old male was shot at the corner of this and that and rushed to some hospital and we're never going to follow up again. Um, that's not very useful. It might even be harmful, but there's so much capacity spent on that sort of reporting that could be redirected. And you know, who am I to tell anybody when and where and where that line is? But it's, it's sort of like the, the difference in police budgets and violence prevention budgets. If you just look at it like a budget, one, one strategy might be to look at what you can move. Okay, I, I know uh, Tristram has his hand up, but I want to go quickly to Bethany Bruner, uh, who has a few comments to make, and then we'll go to Tristram. Uh, Bethany, you can unmute. Hi, Bethany. Hi, thanks for giving me the floor. Um, I, like like Sarah, I the deadline reporting issue is a problem. You know, I work for the USA Today Network, and so we're in this process of revamping our public safety coverage and trying to be more empathetic, but I am the lone public safety reporter. So I am being asked to cover a hearing or cover a press conference that the mayor's having on funding for community programs to help reduce violence at 11, turn that story around by our 2.30 print deadline, and then go out in the community and try and build relationships. Oh, and cover this breaking news and do all this. Oh, and by the way, don't get overtime. So trying to find all of that balance to be able to make the connections to create these long-term stories, to address these complex issues, to build trust, because Let's be honest, most of the communities I go in, I don't look like the people I'm covering. They don't trust me just because I, I look like I'm a white woman. So I, there's extra effort that has to go into building those relationships and building that trust that there's just not time to do. So I'm curious what other newsrooms are doing, what they're, they're trying to see work that we can maybe adapt because I'm not getting more help. I'm not getting additional reporters. Um, to help me out. That's just not happening. Thank you, Bethany. Uh, I see Tina Brown is uh, has her hand up. So let me go to her before I go back to Tristram. Tina. Hi, good afternoon. I, um, I'm working on a story about violence in Savannah. And I was, I covered um, police and courts for 25 years, took a long break. And uh, I was asked the nonprofit to do the story. And I found a new um, I call it a wrinkle. Um, the policies, the council, the mayors, there are not only the policy people, but they're activists. And they are the surge for um, the discussion. And um, when you ask the hard questions, they want to stay on that public relations mode. And it was, it was kind of interesting how... Um, you know, uh, they're on their social media. They're not only uh, the majority of um, the people who speak the most are um, they're survivors of violence. And, you know, you, you see their grief that's emoting. And it was just like this, uh, it was just a new um, type of story where I end up having to do a um, sidebar about how grief is, um, is, is, you know, before you become the celebrity or the advocate or the outreach um, or nonprofit person, you might have to get some counseling. You might, I mean, it was like this wounded, these, some people are wounded people and they're speaking out, but they're speaking in a way that it, it is anguish. And um, I, I just wondered if I was unique. Um, where the politicians have been elected, uh, the activists have been uh, elected as the politicians, and how, how, how do you, I'm trying to get the, con the context right, but it, it's complex. 
What's, what's the takeaway from that, Tina? I mean, do you, you think, you know, the empathy, obviously empathy works, but are you getting the kinds of stories you want? Well, I, I did. I mean, I did the general uh, story about um, the surge and how more, um, more people, more people in the city are being victimized by people are stealing uh, in their cars and their cars they are leaving their guns in the cars. And so they're mm -hmm. providing a new flow of guns because it's legal that they can carry their guns in their cars. And so um, it seems like they, uh, it, it's kind of a, a place where they can get the guns and then they use the guns for in the uh, assaults and the homicides. So that was the basic story. But the, when I, then I saw the people who were speaking out the most, um, they, you know, who, who do they go for help? And so I ended up talking to the counselors, the uh, people in uh, the chaplains in the hospitals, as well as the um, uh, ministers. And so, I mean, that's how ultimately that came about. But it was just kind of um, right, right. difficult for a minute. Tristram? Uh, Tristram, over to you. Uh, yep, sorry about that. Uh, so I heard, let's respond to Bethany and Sarah. I really feel their anguish. Uh, and I just wanted to offer this from a, a, a grizzled veteran. I, I, this panel has re really um, uh, spoke to me, ha, 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 because this is why I left daily journalism. I remember I left daily journalism because there was not a big appetite in the newsroom to write you know, interesting stories about what was causing the violence, et cetera, along, you know, feature stories. And here's, here's my advice to these young journalists struggling is you have to be greedy, be greedy, do your projects that you love, because that's what's get, that's what gets rewarded in journalism, not um, meeting your quotas. I guarantee you, if you write a story that you really cared about, uh, and you gave short shrift to the press conference, the three press conferences you had to cover that day, nobody is going to notice. <clears throat> and if you produce a, a wonderful tale about a family losing, you know, and somebody coming out from a, coming back from incarceration or something, a real, a real tale, uh, you will be gratified and your bosses will be gratified as well. Um, and... Uh, and that has always worked for me. Just be greedy for yourself. Don't, and you can't look to your newsrooms for what you need because they're at, at this stage in the game, they're not going to give it to you. And the other thing was that I wanted to mention was that the, uh, the research that we're being exposed to here is the value. That's the practical takeaway. The, the experts, the papers, et cetera. And you can use those to inform those longer stories um, uh, that are going to have a bigger impact than the three press conferences you're writing about. So Tristram knows wherever he speaks. I'll give a shout out to him. We just uh, republished a story he did for GQ um, this month on um, a wrongful conviction that was an excellent story. It was a long form story that I felt so totally compelling. So I recommend that to uh, you guys if you take a look at it. Um, uh, Jim, you, I saw you nodding your head at a couple of things. So um, uh, fire away. Um, okay, thanks again. I'll, I'll try to be brief because I want to hear from everybody because they're pressing so many buttons. Um, you know, on, on Tristram's point of being greedy, I was frankly very greedy and very aggressive in my newsroom career to get to do the things that I thought were important. And at the same time, this, the challenge is even high, the bar is even higher. Because we heard um, Khaled, Khaled from Advanced Peace yesterday, talk about the importance of humility in, when working in, in gun violence prevention. And you have to balance those two things. So that's also incredibly difficult. Something I've gotten better at when I'm older, get, as I got as I get older, but but not so much when I was younger in newsrooms. On, on the topic of you know being mindful of of the anguish and grief that you know people have gone through before they become you know activists or advocates or get get involved in violence prevention. I mean that's really one of the first important facets of you know trauma informed reporting. There's a whole you know trauma journalism movement with the Dar Center and so on, and um, and and that's. That's an important step. I just, you know, one anecdote that comes to mind. There was one woman at 
um, I don't want to out her now, but one of the women speaking at the summit, one, one of the moms, a, a woman who'd lost a child to gun violence, she was very charged up before the panel, and I, I hardly knew her. And she was ex talking to another panelist about the importance of sharing her anger. And I worried about it being disruptive or counterproductive. But in fact, it led to one of the most important outcomes of, of the summit. She made, made a recommendation that news organizations need to provide resources for, for people harmed by gun violence. And um, so, so I just say in general, yeah, it, it can be really difficult, but maybe they're they're also the most uh, valuable, potentially the most valuable sources. I, I think it was very instructive to hear, uh, I can't remember who actually made the point, but I've heard it so many times, is that when we talk about gun violence, we're talking about perpetrators who are also victims and vice versa. And, and that point probably can't be made enough that these are actually people, they're not predators. And I think that's where we too often get lazy, is that when we talk about a, what we think is an awful shooting or drive-by shooting or whatever, we concentrate on the shooting and the savagery and the barbarity of it, forgetting that these are real people and that, you know, these are not, you know, a 15 year old who picks up a gun has probably, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, Mr. Evil or Dr. Evil um, that we end up trying to paint him at, you know, we use a New York Post headline or something like that. So I think it's, it's important for us to step back, think of the language we use. Um, this is something we can do regardless of the resources that we have. Um, I'm going to move to Erin Heffernan from the St. Louis Post Dispatch. Hello, um, I'm the public, one of the public safety reporters at the Post Dispatch, and I just wanted to throw in a few um, things for people that do have to report daily. Um, I know there's a lot of feature writers here, but um, just a couple things that we've done that I feel like when you do only have maybe a couple hours um, a day to finish a story about you know, something spot news. Um, we've started sort of mining our own data a little bit more, um, our own homicides, um, putting sort of, it's a project we're uh, gonna launch um, in the next month or so where we actually have every reporter when you're covering um, a, a homicide, you have to put in a bunch of detailed information. Um, so then when we mm -hmm. are on deadline, we can, um, include some, you know, better data about what that neighborhood has seen or what that age group has seen. Um, and I think that that's been really helpful when you don't have a lot of time or resources to give a little bit more context. Um, the other, like, note, I guess, for more daily reporters that I've found helpful was um, when I'm on the of a homicide, um, I've uh, started, when you have one of those good interviews, someone, you know, maybe a relative of a victim or something like that, um, I've started keeping them in one file on my phone and getting their phone numbers and sometimes putting in my calendar to a note to follow up with that person. Um, and I've found a lot of uh, just keeping their phone numbers in one place and maybe a couple notes about them has been really helpful for when I am doing that deeper stuff on gun violence or, um, you know, sometimes I've gotten a spark that, that this could be a deeper story here and just like putting it on your calendar to call that person back because you will forget about them if you don't do that. So just a couple tips. Okay, thank you, Erin. So we have a couple of people who are actually posting questions. Uh, I don't know if they're shy, but I'd like to bring them into the conversation on screen. Um, Got a question from David Holthouse, from Stephanie Casanova, some really good remarks. But uh, meanwhile, um, Sarah Bowden has her hand up. So uh, Sarah, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that there were a lot of things helpful with this training. I feel like my comment was very pointed, but the framing you talked about, um, language, appropriate language, things that we should and should not include, that was really helpful. And I think that will help in daily news. I just wanted to say that. Okay, I'm going to get some other folks in the um, in the mix as soon as I make my fingers work. Hang on a second. Okay, I'm going to move over to David Halthouse to get him to uh, talk. David, you're on the screen if you'd like to say a few words. Uh, David, you're on. If you can you can hear me? There you go. Here. David is a freelancer from Cincinnati. If he, uh, David, are you? Yeah. 
Hi, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I was just interested in the uh, yeah. conversation about uh, resources and uh, lack of reporters. And um, yeah. I, I guess my, my comment was that, um, you know, that's been an issue um, ever since I've been in this business, which has been a pretty long time. And uh, it's obviously not getting any better, but um, the, the one uh, solution, if you want to call it that, that I, I have found has worked and was really able to uh, practice um, at a couple places is to um, prioritize and really decide uh, in advance, you know, what issues that your organization wants to take on and then have a, an agreement that this is, we're, we're going to apply resources to, to these issues. And I think someone alluded to this before, but let the other things go and then um, don't worry about it. Uh, set, set priorities and, you know, ha have that conversation with the management and the editors. So everybody's on board and they can, uh, they can direct resources to whatever priorities. And I would think at a lot of, a lot of these, uh, a lot of organizations, uh, violence and gun violence, community violence should be a priority and, and would be a priority for coverage. Thank you, David. Um, Stephanie Casanova? Yes, thanks. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Stephanie is with the Chicago Tribune. Yeah. Um, so I just, I guess, first wanted to echo uh, some of the advice that I think I've heard a few people here say. Um, I've been in all size newsrooms from cities of like 50,000 to now the Chicago Tribune. And I think my way to go about prioritizing the stories I care about um, is to just to do it and then ask for the time to continue the mm -hmm. project I'm working on, right? So I'll-, I'll and they give it to you. It's already in process. So, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I think I posted a, a solutions journalism network. I've gotten grants from them. And so they provide funding and what you can do with that funding sometimes is use some of it or your editors obviously will use some of it to hire a freelancer to kind of cover the parts of your job that are those daily or quick turnaround stories. And then you can focus on your solutions project or you can hire a freelancer to help you with solutions projects, but you know. Um, I've done that before. Um, but I also wanted to touch on someone said, uh, I think, Jim, you were talking about somebody who suggested uh, providing resources. And so that seems like an easy, quick solution. So I, I just was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about how we go about that, right? Like I've seen about suicide or mental health that at the provide a little bit of that what you're talking about and how how should we present that to our editors as a as something we should just tack on to the end of our stories or something like that good question Thank sure you. so I, I can tell you what's happening here in philadelphia and how and, and i'm starting to spot it in other cities as well so thank, thank you stephanie so so yeah, as i said a, a, a mom who had lost her her uh, son talked about how incredibly disabled she was as a really intelligent aggressive professional woman and how she just couldn't find help and she wondered when she read the news just like you said stephanie she she saw resources at the end of stories about addiction and suicide and 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 many other issues and just said why, why isn't there anything for us you know, 2250 shootings last year in Philadelphia and I saw it was I was I was on the edge of the stage and I got to see lots of friends who look, work in newsrooms kind of look at each other and shrug and say we can do that um, now on one level it, you can do some sort of superficial stuff we can all google up organization names and and phone numbers and email addresses and put them out there but maybe we need to do a little better um, it, at, at first blush uh, a digital first organization at, at WHYY here Billy Penn uh, put together did a assemble a good list, a very good list of resources and shared it and made it available to other news organizations in the city and a few things happened. NBC10 added, added it to the end, a link to the end of their list. Um, if I recall correctly, CBS3 made their, they, um, they took the same content and put it on their own page so they get the click, but that's great. They put the resources there as well. Fox News replicated it. They didn't contact any of us as far as I know, but they did their own version. But then something really incredible happened. The Trace was hiring a, a local K 
community editor in one of the cities with, one, with the most gun violence. And, and um, I, I worked pretty hard on this, but, but I'm, I'm very grateful that they made that investment in Philadelphia. And they, they hired someone who, they, they hired uh, Sabrina Iglesias, a, a young journalist here, who's then hired some other freelancers from around the city. And they've created a site called Up the Block. It's at uptheblock.org. And, and, and it's, it's a resource list but they've actually gone out and done much more. They've gone out and met with the community and said, what do you really need? Which organization really works for you? Who really delivers? And, and, and then, the, so the next step, and I can't speak for them, but the next step in my mind is I can imagine yeah, more and more news organizations saying, go to up the block because you're not asking them to point to another news organization's resource list. Yeah, I mean, the trace is another news organization, but up the block, not so much. And, and the, um, and the trace is, you know, a, a Philadelphia competitor. And so, so, um, you know, I would love to see the day when at the end of every episodic news report on TV, the re the, it would be it seems pretty simple for the anchor to say, and if you need help, go to uptheblock.org or something like that. So we're, we're just, so it's, they've been wor working, the folks at the trace should speak for themselves, but they've been working on this for a year. Um, it debuted recently. They're off to a fantastic start and that, and that. And I know they're working on distribution with other news organizations. So there are a lot of, like everything else, it's expensive, it takes time. There are a lot of steps, but I'm really, I'm, I'm incredibly personally thrilled that it came out of, out of the summit, but so many more people have worked on it since and um, I like where it's going. So Sabrina, as it happens, is one of our fellows, um, <laughs> but, this, but she's not here at the moment. So she's, unfortunately, she can't tell us more about it, but uh, <laughs> she's on our network. So I've got Jay Gilmer. We're just about running out of time. We promised to end at five. Uh, but I want to give Jay an um, uh, opportunity to say a few words. Well, thank you very much. Let me make one, ask you a couple, a couple, a question here that maybe the, uh, the audience has a, a response to. I mean, since I am, I do work for government. I am the Stop the Violence Coordinator for the city of Pittsburgh. I'll be reaching out to Sarah to speak and share some notes here. But I would like to know is that because, is that because of my work, I am in contact with story after story of violence prevention, individuals, families that have lost people, that have had people redeemed, uh, resources that are available. But to us, it's not even news. How do I make it news so that some media person might want to cover that stuff? Uh, well, that's a question that has a lot of answers, but does anybody want to raise their hand and respond? I've got some ideas, maybe Jim does. I, I just made this briefly in a nutshell. I run into lots of journalists looking for sources and lots of sources looking for coverage. Somebody has to provide that connection. That's something, that's another thing we're working on. It's not launched, but we're working on expert directories with specific detail about how to reach, you know, maybe not open to the public, but specific details, how to reach people, what their expertise is, what the timing is. But some somebody's got to, so there's a disconnect there between two groups with needs and somebody's got to step up and do that. And I'm trying to do that. And I'd like to see organizations with more resources do that or help us. Okay, thank you, um, um, Jay and uh, and Jim. So I think um, we'll have to close it now because I don't want to keep you guys uh, more than I promised. But I want to thank you all for being part of this. Uh, and I hope you got something useful out of um, the roundtable. Uh, Jim, I really appreciate your um, moderation on this. Um, I mean, the fact is a moderator. You're not going to moderate. It's a very 